Well, welcome to First Saturday now, and we're going to look at the corresponding episode on the Eden podcast, which is playing right now, which is on Ephesians and submission. And if you want to go a little deeper, we have study guides as well. So that would be book two, Beyond Eden. That's uh, if you just simply went to Amazon and typed in the Eden book series, Fleming, bang, you would get get all four books. They would come up. The Eden book series, Fleming, and or you just type in Beyond Eden. Uh, so the full title is Beyond Eden, Ephesians 5.15 to 6.9. And that is a teaching point right there. That's an important thing to talk about, those verses. Okay, so that's book two. Now, coming up, and I'll just, while I'm thinking about it, uh, on in two weeks, we're going to start a new series, and we're going to go through the Book of Eden. So this is the, the Eden Workshop, and we're going to be doing the Book of Eden um, starting Monday at uh, 7.30 p.m., and if you want to sign up for that, you go to true316.com slash workshop. That's an easy title. So tru316.com workshop. And we've got a special uh, sale going on right now. I don't I don't know. The prices will probably change. But right now, do you know what it costs? Uh, normally $69 for the for the workshop. And uh, the surprise price right now is $316. <laughs> so, I, where did I pull up that number? But Mimi, Mimi uh, lobbied heavily. And so we've got 316 for this for this time around. So that's a good, that's a good thing. All right. Let's just start with a word of prayer and we'll get going. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for revealing so much to us. And yet, Lord, the enemy's out there and he's he's a liar and he's the author of confusion and he's been sowing discord. And so we pray right now that you will help us to clarify things according to your word, to keep our finger on the text, and to praise you for all that we find. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have any questions at all on any passage, they're fair game. Just put them in the in the chat thing, and we'll look, we'll look at them as we go along, okay? Uh, and specifically on Ephesians, we'll look at this, and let's just talk. Otherwise, I will review okay any any questions first of all that you want to make sure we hit as we go into ephesians the famous verse in there would be ephesians 5 22 right everybody likes to go there and yet that is a sub point of a sub point of a sub point pretty much so you want to make the main idea the main idea and 522 is nowhere near the main idea so to understand where that sub sub point fits into everything, we got to understand the passage itself. Okay. So the fun thing uh, we've already in our early before we started here, we were referring to uh, the the think again steps. I have a, a little shorthand version of them here. So these are the the questions we always like to ask ourselves when we hit a passage. So I'll just review them. Think again about the context of the passage. So the passage is the last part of Ephesians 5. Okay, we know that, but what's the context of all of Ephesians? We're going to look at that. Think again about the content of the passage. What's the passage say? Think again about the key image and or idea. Think again about the verses of special interest. Think again about the points of application. And this is a good one. Think again about what the passage does not say. Okay. So that's, there's a lot of things going on there. People are trying to say, oh, it means this. or oh. So, for example, I'll just tell you, a lot of commentators say, this is the longest passage on marriage in the New Testament. And it's not. It's about something totally else. As an English teacher, I wonder if how that sentence is, something totally else. <laughs> but you get the idea. All you right. Have so have, you, you have to give people a break on Paul. The, his sentences and his structures are extremely long and garbly oh, for modern, yeah. for modern uh, people. <laughs> That's right. And we we like to add uh, headers and you know. So okay, let's go back. I was a junior high English teacher, and I got to teach my students that there's a theme and a paragraph. Hey, we got a paragraph, which means hmm, three or four sentences hooked together. Paul goes a lot farther than that, three or four sentences. And then we, then I used to teach my kids that you have a theme sentence at the beginning of, the, of a paragraph, or maybe at the end of the paragraph, or rarely in the middle of the paragraph, but the main idea is usually at the beginning of the paragraph. So you go paragraph by paragraph by paragraph, and you can pull out the main idea, main idea, main idea, and make an outline. 
which is what people do to this passage. And that's not safe. But that's where we're talking about question number two, think again about the content of the passage. We have to define what the passage is. So we've got a total of, and this doesn't, this isn't fair. I'm going to say it anyways. We have a total of six chapters in Ephesians, chapters one, two, three, four, five, and six. Those numbers were added centuries and centuries later. And when Paul wrote it, there were no chapters one, two, three, four, five, and six, especially where they stuck the six is a very bad location uh, for our understanding the passage. So well, we'll let, leave that be. How about if we go at it this way? How about the first half and the second half? And I want to focus on the second half. If we start with the second half of the passage, so that'd be around chapter four, it's uh, Paul says, and it depends on your translation, but uh, maybe the King James has it. The Greek certainly does. It says walk. He says oh, walk yeah. in a certain way. Do you have that? Sandy, do you have walk? Uh, no, I did this study before. And if you didn't look it up in Strong's, you'd have no idea that these phrases all started with the same word. Yeah, yeah. So we've got, we start chapter four with walk. And then about oh, halfway down, we get another walk. Uh, oh, by the way, we have two words. We have therefore walk, therefore walk. That's more important. We get more of a pattern. So therefore walk, the beginning of chapter four, therefore walk, halfway down. Chapter five is a therefore walk. And then farther down, there's another therefore walk. And then when we get to 516, 515, there we go. It says, therefore walk circumspectly or very carefully. That's the most complex instruction. And then we get all the way down to, oh, there's no more therefore walks, but 610, what does it say in 610? And therefore walk. No, we're, well, wait a minute. We're being, we're being, we're in defensive mode now. So we're not walking anymore. We just have to stand from the fiery darts of the devil. So we have six sections, five are therefore walk and the sixth one is therefore stand. So the passage we're interested in starts in 515, and it just keeps going, goes all the way down through the end of chapter five and through the first nine verses of chapter six until we hit therefore stand in verse 10. So when I referred to the cover of, of the book Beyond Eden, we have the numbers, therefore, we have Ephesians 515 to 515 to 69. Okay. So the point is, that's our passage, 5.15 to 6.9. Now, let's just, yeah, there's lots of good things there. I'll just leave it at that. Number two, think again about the content of the passage. So now we're in the passage. We have to figure out what's going on in the passage. And if you start with 5.15, you're going to see uh, a pattern of four things. you got don't do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, don't do that, do this. And we've got four, four things going on. And then if you look, starting with uh, 519, the last of those four things in 518b is picked up. And there's four things now talking about how to do the last part of 515, no, 518b, which is be filled with the Spirit. So if anybody wants to know, how do I be filled with the Spirit? Or how can I be filled with the Spirit? Or what do I do when I'm filled with the Spirit? And they want to go to the gifts passages, the gifts to the individuals, like in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. That's, that's not what this is talking about. And if they want to go to the gifts to the church, like in Ephesians 3, that's not what this is talking about. So it's not the gifts to the individual. It's not the gifts. So being filled with the Spirit. Other places, it talks about gifts of the Spirit to the individual. Other places, it talks about gifts to the church, to build up the church. This is not that. So in Ephesians 5, 18b, be continually being filled, refilled, overflowing with the Spirit. Is how the Greek grammar works. And then we have four points in verses 19. Now watch, 19 should be cut up into two, two verses. So I'm going to call it 19a, which is the first half. Then we have 19b, then we have 20. Then we have 21. So we have four parts coming out of there. And there's a parallelism structure there. So the very first one, 19A, is parallel with verse 21. And the two middle ones, 19B and 20, are in parallel construction with each other. The, the ones in the middle are to the Lord, to the Lord. And the ones 19A and 21 are to one another, to one another. 
Got it. So when you're being filled with the spirit, there's two things that the spirit bubbling up in you helps you do toward the Lord. And there's two things that helps you do to one another. This is very, very important because the fourth point now, verse 21, I'm expecting another pattern of fours to develop. And he does. He's going to give us another pattern of fours. It's going to go all the way down to 532. And ta-da, the big idea then is that Christ and the church are one joint body. So he's, that's what he's talking about. And then what it turns out is that 522 all the way to 69 is a giant chiasm. It parallels pretty much the construction of Genesis 2 and 3. Paul knew Genesis 2 and 3. He liked to use it. So 522 builds up to 532 and winds up at 69. As so we have this beautiful chiasm going on here. And so this main point, <clears throat> of 532 is another summary of what happened in 518 so paul says be being filled with the spirit because you, we are in one joint body united with christ so of course we're my head and my body share one bloodstream okay and jesus as the head and us as the body of the one body in christ we share the holy spirit you know the spirit of christ flowing flowing all through us so it's a it's a beautiful picture. When he starts, nope. One, two, three, four, five eighteen, be being filled with the spirit. One, two, three, four, five twenty-one, submitting. He he changes that word submitting. Everybody knows submitting means vertical submitting. Somebody's over and somebody's under. But he changes it in many, many ways. And we're not gonna look in those details right now, but we'll just notice it. He says, mutually submitting. I like to say reciprocally submitting. I'm doing it. You're doing it back to me. Yeah, but I'm doing it back to you. And we're doing it back to each other. We're reciprocally submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of Christ. So again, it's in, in the body of Christ we're doing this. But verse 21 is one of that matched pair. So 519a and the submitting are got to be joined together. So let's put them together. We'll pull them together and put them together like this. And so what is the first part? It says speaking one to another, which is not real detailed. But there's a parallel passage in Colossians 3.16, which is. And it says, uh, speaking, teaching and admonishing. So it's got two words instead of the, the speaking. It says teaching and admonishing one another. And then it has those other details that, that we find in, 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 that, in the verse in Ephesians. So teaching and admonishing. So what happens is, is, as Christians being filled with the Spirit, we teach and correct one another. And then as Christians filled with the Spirit, verse 21, we submit to the teaching and correction we get from one another. So every, this is the priesthood of believers. Every one of us gets to teach and correct every other one of us in being filled with the Spirit. And that's just the body working together. You know, if my toe is hurt and my eyeball looks down there and my hand works on it, and we, you know, we all work together in, in, in the physical body and the idea is we work together in the spiritual body. I'm not going to go into that big chiasm, 22 to 6, 9, because the center idea is sufficient. Okay. We are united in, in one body in Christ. The verse before it is important because he says, this is just like Adam and Eve in the garden, which would be Genesis 2, 24. And if we've gotten Genesis 3.16 wrong, we'll probably get Genesis 2 wrong, and we'll, we'll have a bad idea of how Adam and Eve got along, and then we'll plop that bad interpretation into this part of Ephesians 5.32, and then we're in trouble. So we have to go to Genesis 3.16 and get that clear, and then we get Genesis 2 clear, and then we get Genesis 3 clear. Ah, and then we can interpret the New Testament passages. And Paul already had that clear. Paul did not have the misinterpretations that we're seeing bothering the church today. Now, that was an awful lot and awful fast. And I apologize for the, the fire hose on you, but that's that's the basic summary. Okay, pop up with some questions here. Let's go. All right. I have a, que I have a question. Let's go with Carolyn first then. Okay, I, I heard about the chiasms quite a bit through in the bible like genesis and ephesians now does this say something about ancient near eastern writing that they knew of this kind of style it didn't just happen right 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 yeah they did that it all the time purposeful so if you go to uh, genesis chapters six seven and eight 
on uh, the flood, you will be astounded to notice that it's a giant chiasm. I like to call it a rainbow pattern. And so the interesting thing about a chiasm is that that the first part over here quite often corresponds is 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 uh, is matched by the corresponding part on the other side, and sometimes details are even added to it. So you've got what they call A and A prime, and you go up B and B prime, C. C. And this one goes all the way up to I think it's M M. <laughs> we we go all the way up through Z, and then we start over with A A, and we it's a huge chiasm, and they love it because these people did not have uh, an iPad in front of them that they could look at this stuff. They had to listen. And so this was oral learning and they had to pick up on the, on the clues and they would listen to the sounds and the vowel sounds and the consonants, all that kind of stuff that would help them remember and keep the passage there. They, it was repeated orally. And so this pattern uh, was a big deal. Uh, we had a friend when we went to Strasbourg, France, and he was an author and a scholar and uh, he was working on his second volume on of commentary on Ephesians. Uh, no, on Ezekiel. Excuse me, on Ezekiel. And he said, "It's all chiasm. It's all these patterns throughout. And every time he, okay, well, I'm on Ezekiel chapter 17. Let me find the chiastic patterns. <laughs> and he did. Um, I don't know what other scholars have thought about that. I haven't read their reviews on his work, but he, what he showed me at the time was, you know. Brian Tidiman, T-I-D-I-M-A-N, Brian Tidiman. So a very interesting guy. That was in French. I don't know if you'll find his work in English, but uh, uh, he So if you want to go do that, you can look it up. Yes, uh, Beth. I would love to share my screen for the chiasm that you um, that I drew that you you looked at. Would that be all right with you? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. Coming up. I have it pulled up, and that way you can visual, everybody can visualize what you're talking about. So all hold right. on. Yes. Give me Give me a moment to get to it. So we want I've to take this it. material and make it our own. And that's what Beth and Shara have done. Yeah, exactly. Um, I just have to get back to you for a minute to share my screen. Choose what to share. First, let me find out what I'm sharing. Since I'm new to all this, just a little bit, I just started listening to the podcast season one again. What is chiasm? What does that mean? Okay, well, well, we're actually going to find out right now. We're going to see this with uh, Beth. Go ahead and show us what you got. Well, okay, I well, I'll, hit... I'll, I'll, let me say a chiasm is like a bell curve. Have where I hit there, the share and the, you can see it? The, yeah, the main, I can, we can see it now. It's good. The main idea is in the middle. And then these other ideas build up to and come down from the middle idea. Okay, we, we saw it and then it went away. Yeah. And was that Jenny talking or was that Jennifer talking? I forget who was asking about the question. Was was that Emily. Emily. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Okay. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So uh, we just lost the picture there. I have it in the book too. So let me look in the book. I hope I have it in the book. I'm sure I do. It's, it's just multiple. It, it's a structure of the text that reflects each other, almost like there's a mirror in the middle, you come up to this side, it reflects back. But sometimes, I wanted to ask you about this, but from what I heard in the other, um, in the Bama podcast, sometimes it's not always exactly um, like A, B, C, up, C, B, A, down in your example, but it could be A, B, C, A, B, C. Yep, yep. But, but yep. the point is that these points uh, kind of like in, if you've heard of how in Proverbs, there's always these doubles, you have like, don't do this and don't do that. And it's really saying the same thing, just saying it two different ways. Yep. It's kind of like that with the chiasms. You're saying the same thing in some sense, but you might be adding to it, giving a little more knowledge, but they reflect each other and say this. And so it might be, you know, this, this, this. And now this is very much like this one over here. And this is very much like that one over there. And this one over here. If that makes sense to you, Emily. <laughs> that's, that's great. Now, what you're talking about now, we're talking about literary devices, ways that you write it that, that kind of show up. Okay. Um, all I have is a little one here. Maybe you can see this one though, but you can see it. There, there's a, there is the Genesis 2, 3 rainbow or bell curve or chiasm. Okay. And so section A starts on the bottom. And then section A prime finishes up. Okay, now we've got we've got Beth. You're showing yours. This is Ephesians now. Paul is 
picked up the same idea. And you notice the A and A prime are at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. What this really is, maybe not so much a chiasm as a parallelism. So I would say that the A and A prime and the B and B prime work together. Um, to be a chiasm, it, it, it's, it's, so it's what you have in the circle at the top is the key idea number four or point four at the end of the pattern of fours in 518B. Yeah. But so we have. To understand, look at A1, A prime over here. Submit to each other out of respect for Christ. So 521 is that one. And you, you can't just take it by itself. You have to take the other one, A, over here, as she has a diagram, speaking to each other. See this with Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? If you go to Colossians 3.16, it says, teaching and admonishing one another with Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And he wrote Ephesians and Colossians at the same time, and they were delivered around by the same people to the different churches in, in, in Asia Minor, Turkey. So we've got a little one, one uh, scripture interpreting scripture. So there's the parallelism. Okay, that's good. Again, it's tough to get this all figured out. That's why we have the podcast that teaches it to you first. Then we have the books that we added, the study guides that help you. And then we said, no, we got to do the workshops. And that has become maybe the, the best thing we've got out there is the workshops where people, what we do is we meet for uh, eight evenings in a row, Monday through Thursday from 7.30 to 8.30 Central. And the next week, Monday through Thursday, and we take the study guides in the book and then we discuss them. And then you can always review back to the chapter content. And we have a batch of graduates now. There's a it's either 10 or 12 people have gone through all four workshops, which is a big deal. And we now have a new certificate that people are getting. Shar, if you or Beth, if you could get out of that, I'd like to show the certificate here. Um, thank you. So let me let me do my screen here after I figure out where it is. This is informal, isn't it? On the uh, on first Saturday session here. I have been requested to do every Saturday. And we did every Saturday in, last month. I'm not sure. Um, I'll get your input on that in a second here. All right, here we go. This is the certificate that we're using. Da, 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 da. <laughs> your name here. And I've seen Sandy's on hers and, and the others too. So um Look at the top. We've got the four workshops coming across the top. They correspond to the covers of the four books, too. So we have the Eden workshop on Genesis 2 to 3, the Beyond Eden worship workshop on Ephesians 5 and 6. Now, why is the title Beyond Eden? Anybody know? Because, because it's... it's the, go ahead. Then Genesis, what we have between believers in Christ. so in the old testament the holy spirit came on people and then would sometimes go off too in the new testament we have the holy spirit in us and the experience that we have in the new testament with christ goes beyond what even adam and eve had in the garden so what we what we've got is you know as good as it gets beyond eden then we have the Back to Eden workshop on uh first Timothy two and three that that one really is a question of who how do you treat leaders in the church who have fallen into sin and gone astray? Do you throw them out and say, you know, go work in a furniture store or a used car lot? Never come back inside the church? Or is it possible to restore them? And, and there's good news there. And then uh, we don't take sin, you know, we don't take sin lightly, but Jesus is, Paul is talking about Jesus' example, and there is some restoration. Uh, some blasphemers are abandoned to Satan to learn not to blaspheme, and others are are taught by Timothy and maybe Priscilla and are restored to full ministry. And then workshop number four is because of Eden workshop. So for, because of what we know from Genesis 3.16, etc., when we look at the quotations that Paul inserts oh, yeah. in, 
in his letter to the Corinthians, we go, oh, that's not that that's not what he's talking about. What is that? That must be another one of the quotations from the uh, the legalists that he's sticking in there. And I'm going to expect he's going to reply and refute it. Oh, yeah, there he goes. He does refute it. So we've got two passages where he refutes their bad quotes. And then as part of this workshop, we also talk about 1 Peter 3, uh, which bothers a lot of people. And they say, I don't care what you've already figured out. If 1 Peter 3 is a mess, then it's all a mess. <laughs> and I respect that. And we've spent a lot of time working on 1 Peter 3. And what we've discovered is it's talking about wives who are married to unbelievers who need to be one, W-O-N, one to the Lord. And likewise, 3, 7, husbands who are married to unbelievers. Uh, and uh, that and their prayer is that they might be saved and if they act in a in an in a unseemly way it's going to hinder the prayers for their wife's salvation and until the wife is saved she is the weaker partner in the marriage but now all seven of these verses after the person finds christ they don't know these verses yeah they have some they have good stuff in there but they don't apply that's not the number one passage to go to about how do we conduct our marriage not at all so that's the four workshops, and these 10 or 12 people have gone right through that. Your name here has successfully completed the Eden Workshop curriculum with True School, working together to true the verse of Genesis 3.16 and related passages. Joy Fleming, PhD, Psy D, and me. So there we are. Do you want me to change the design? Is this a problem to you, or is this looking okay? I like it. Oh, it looks great. We're just trying to decide. We're, we're, um, we're going to have to go back in our heads and try to. I think we think we did the first three and just have the fourth one remaining. So we'll have to jump in and get that fourth one because we want our certificate too. <laughs> but we're also doing our best to teach it to anybody who'll listen. Okay, so that's why I said it's either ten or ten or twelve because I wasn't sure if you two were the twelve or not. Okay. We might be, but we're going to double check with yeah. Mimi, and uh, I don't know if y'all have us okay. on a list or anything, right. but we'll we'll make sure. But if not, we'll jump in on that last fourth one. If we <laughs> could, we'd circle back around and take, and I'm going to advocate for this. <clears throat> Stop and think about how in, in there's, there's this insidiously, you know, what Jesus talks about, leaven is both good and bad in the scriptures, which is kind of amazing to me, but if you get the wrong stuff in and it permeates your entire world in your mind, we advocate for going back over these um, two and three times. We've, we've, that's one of the things we're trying to do so that we can really get it. Because if this study to show yourself approved, a work person not that doesn't need to be ashamed before the Lord, also the opportunity to be able to give an answer when you're asked, you have to really get deep in these things and because most yep. people don't, and that's the people we're that's the people we're trying to to create a buy-in with is people who don't even want to know what the heck a chiasm is. And look, parallelism. It's okay with me if you completely change my thing and show me what a chiasm should have looked like. Now, if you're going to teach uh, knitting, no, excuse me. If you're going to learn knitting, you practice learning knitting, but you'll know knitting even better if you teach knitting. So if you really sure. want to you, if you really want to master something, you get to teach it. And what I'm hoping I'm going to see coming out of you, this group and the others, is people teaching it to others. Informally, okay. informally is fine. Or even, okay, I hear, I see a hand up. Jenny. <laughs> I volunteer up at Camp Timberley in Wisconsin, and I lead the creation walks. And this week I had like 25 girls and we went into, after wow. we finished it, we went into Genesis 3 and they were listening and then I ended up having to leave for another class, but their counselor said the discussion went on for another 30 minutes. But uh, as I finished, she's like, this was not you. This was the Holy Spirit. Uh, <laughs> it's just really cool. Yeah. Oh, great. Right. Oh, I get goosebumps. <laughs> it's great. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have one student in Texas. We meet on Wednesdays for coffee. And uh, we've almost made it through book one. Great. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah the same. Yes. <laughs> Jennifer's yeah. giving us a thumbs up too. I just signed up for the um for the uh workshop. 
that's oh great up. great yeah. yeah good yeah a whole three dollars and 16 cents <laughs> yeah i really appreciate the introductory price there <laughs> yeah what what we're really hoping for by the way on the workshops is that if uh the next one's going to be 69 dollars uh, but if you become a donor you know, uh, which we call a true partner uh for 25 dollars a month then that covers our expenses and covers your expenses and also supports the work so it brings it down from 69 to 25 that month and we work it out um i'm trying to figure out a lot of business details and i kind of want to talk about that but let's finish up here and then i'm going to stop the recording part and we'll pass that on because i want to talk about the future of the true 316 foundation and i've been getting some uh coaching on that and i want to get your advice on that so uh any other questions about ephesians uh five and six or comments we didn't answer everything right we just talked about what's the what's the passage about and outside of the passage and then what is the lim what are the limits of the passage itself what's the structure of the passage and what's the structure of the key very mm -hmm. key elements of the passage so i'll just say one more thing once we realize that 19a and 21 are going together then we find out that the 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 way to be filled with the spirit is we are teaching and correcting each other and we are submitting to that teaching and correction we get from each other and that submitting is not a vertical it's a horizontal it's a reciprocal submitting and then paul says says okay now i'm going to talk to you about how we're united in the body of christ but I'm going to pick up on this, this, this submitting to one another. And I'm going to give you some examples. And I'm going to start with, uh, let's see, Jesus and the, and, the, and the church. So that's the second half of 523. And the first half, I see, well, that would be a Christian couple that have a good Christian marriage. So just like a Christian couple, they're submitting, they're encouraging, and they're submitting to one another. And just like Jesus and the church, see that? So when we when we hit verse 22, he doesn't even have a verb. And when the Greek doesn't have a verb, you go back to the previous verb and pull it down. The previous verb is submitting, not vertical, somebody over and somebody under, like a husband over and the wife under. No, Christian to Christian, reciprocally submitting to, to one another. Other people use the word mutually. So mutually submitting one to another. That's what gets pulled down to that verse about the wives in verse 22. And if it's mutually, then you got to talk about who and who. You got to talk about two. So it's wives submitting to your husbands as your husbands are submitting to you, as you're each teaching and correcting one another, filled with the Spirit using the word of the Lord. And that's a verse that's been taken out of context and, and weaponized mm -hmm. in a terrible way. Yes, can, I, can I ask a question? Two questions, kind of. One is, so could you just take verse 22 and lay out what it would be literally in the Greek and show how that gets pulled from the previous verse? Yeah, it would be wives to your own husbands. There's no verb. And then as to the Lord or something like that. Yeah, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. And, and not, not, not because your husband is your Lord. <laughs> it's right. in Christ, you know, in the Lord, you know. Right. No. Well, okay. So my other question might be, a little more complex, but let me try to say a few things here. So, um, you know, in history, like the Orthodox Church, obviously Catholicism, and even even more uh, even more older Protestant churches and everything else, the concept of hierarchy within the church structure is very important. And I think a lot of, I feel like a lot of that kind of thing is hinted at or talked seems to be drawing out of verses like this one, because the very next verse is for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now I know that Christ's headship is also servanthood. Like what did he do to show himself as the head? What did he do to show himself as, as Lord over us was to serve us. However, I think like structurally people want to take, want to use those kinds of things as, well, this is, we're looking at you know, kind of a proper order of things. And of course, people want to say things like God is not chaotic, God is full of order, that sort of thing. So it does like, you know, even when you were talking earlier about head and the rest of the body and that sort of thing, I think because of the biological 
sensibilities of what our head is relative to the rest of our body and things like that. There seems to be this sense that, guys, y'all are too loud. Please stop. Please stop. Um, this sense that, um, that I, I guess there's just this hierarchical, hierarchical level of some kind of something bigger over or something maybe more uh, directional, like the head make, you know, directs your thoughts and everything else. It's sort of key and central to the rest of your body, those kinds of things. So could you speak to that a little bit? Because I feel like um, I'm not very far into what you guys have done and what your wife has done. Mm -hmm. But one of the things at this point that feels a little bit lacking is sort of the, um, I get what you're saying about what you see in the text, but then how does that relate to the response that people have had? And can you, argue, can you, can you give some argument or fill in some argument why those sorts of things have been misinterpreted? Yep. So uh, I, I, I feel a little confused after all those nice things that you said. <laughs> Sorry. All right. And I think, I think we all should feel confused <laughs> because it was a lot of different things that you brought in. And so what I like is the clarity of the text. Um, there's a basic rule of interpretation that if it's, if the, you look at a passage, first of all, and you say, I want to take the literal meaning, you know, so Fred was red. Okay. Can I, was Fred really red? Well, it turns out that Fred was my goldfish who was a red goldfish. And yes, Fred was red. Okay. So I can take that literally. Fred was red. Okay. But what if Fred wasn't my goldfish? What if Fred was uh, uh, my neighbor who uh, had just uh, stubbed his toe and was hurting and his face would just turn red? Okay, so that's, a, that's an abstract meaning of red. Fred was red, mm -hmm. literally was red, but what we're really talking about is his emotional state. And somehow I'm giving you the illustration, I feel like I've kind of turned red, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Did, did, did do a good job of pushing those blood yeah. cells. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Fred was red. So what you do is, you, but then maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe that's not really what it meant. Maybe he was, he was rooting for the Boston Red Sox or the, the Cincinnati Reds, or you know. So he, was, he might have hurt his toe, but he was really rooting for the, you know, it was the game was on and he was going, go oh, team, you know, and he was red in that sense, which is more even more of an abstract idea. And I just made this up just now. I think it's working pretty well. So, so here's the deal. Let's look at this idea of Christ as the head of the church as literal, okay? So do we have a literal head over on top of a literal body? No. So we can't take it literally. So then we go to the first level of abstraction. Does a body have two parts? And is Christ one part of the body? And is the church the other part of the body of Christ? Uh, frankly, yes. And what happens when you're doing interpretation? If the first sense makes sense, so the first level of abstraction in this case, if the first sense makes sense, seek no other sense. But what happens is people don't even know that there's this possible, they don't even consider the head body unit metaphor. And in the book Beyond Eden, we talk about that. We're going to go back into Ephesians chapter three, where Paul talks about a joint body. I like the hyphenated, you know, we got one joint body. And so it says that we Christians are a joint body. We are joint heirs. We are, you know, so he literally talks about a joint body. And then later on, he talks about Christ. He talks about the husband and the wife. He talks about Adam and Eve are one body. Mm -hmm. And the word in Hebrew back in the Genesis 2 is a had, which is the same as the Shema in Deuteronomy. Hero Israel, the Lord is one. So we don't have a literal one. We've got a united one. And so all of this gets, I'm not even talking about is the head, the authority, or is the head of the thinker, or is the head, the source. Those are higher levels of abstraction. And I'm not even going to ever go there because I'm down here with Christ and the church are one unit. Ta -da, we have a sufficient and a, an exquisite interpretation of the, of that passage so when he when in 523 he says christ is the head of the church great you know we're united and it says a husband is the head of the wife yep there two became one flesh they're united and all this other stuff where people are struggling is quite creative and usually at least a bit wrong and sometimes a lot wrong so that's that's a brief summary and we've got a, just a few more minutes to go here so um uh, 
But that's a great question. And that's a quick answer. But I don't think we have to go any more abstract. And there are a lot of dear hearts, okay, a lot of good people that are that are on this side or on that side, and they're, but they're all up there in this abstract stuff. And why? Why? We just don't need to talk about that. And so they, yeah, okay. There's a great picture that I drew. Not very good artist. So we've got. Uh, you can look at the little circle on the top. Is that the head? No. Is a big circle on the bottom? Is that the head? No. But look at the brackets together. That's that's one joint body. That's how it works. I discovered this concept uh, became clear when I was looking at an ant in Africa outside our house. And you want to look for those ants because they can hurt. And there was a whole line of driver ants, and there there was there was the one ant. There was, and he had three parts to his body. Each of the parts could not stand on its own, but the three went together and formed one joint body. I think that's what's going on here. And um, if others other explanations, the more abstract ones, make sense, that's great. We see half of your diagram there. You need to move it over a bit. I see less than half now. There, there's more than half, but it's hard to read. <laughs> so yeah, and that's from what that's from uh, the book uh, "Familiar Leadership Heresies Uncovered." Page one sixty nine, three introductory ideas, and it goes with the body discussion that you were talking about. Christ's example: uh, wife and husband submit reciprocally. To, uh, verses 21 through 22 and 24, Christ's example on the other side, as Christ is Savior of the church, his body. We're submit, uh, submitting reciprocally, verse 23. Husband loves as Christ gave himself for the church. Person cares for the body as Christ nourishes and cherishes the church, his body. Yeah. So it's just really beautiful. So all the way up until verse 32, he's talking about united as one. He's talking about as Christ... There's a linchpin in 525, which is patterned after Genesis 3.16. And one part goes back up as Christ gave himself for the church. And the other part goes down as Christ loved the body and a person loves their own body. This, this all, again, is part of the structure. Mm. And uh, it opens up pretty quickly once you, once you start looking for the key structures. We're going to have a giant chiasm. We have limits to the passage. We have that one to the pattern of fours, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. We have the on the way down, we have the 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 family. So as a husband and wife, they're getting along. And the parents and the children, they're getting along. And even the masters and the servants, they're getting along reciprocally in the Christian home. He tells the servants what to do in chapter six. And then he says to the masters, you do the same thing, which is outrageous. It makes no sense. So all these people, these wonderful people talk about the household codes. The German word is Hashtafeln. Okay. They, they talk about the household codes. They just won't give up that idea. I don't believe there is a household code. It's kind of like a household code. Yeah. But it's not at all. He's talking about these three different ways, three different groupings in the family, spouses, Parents and children, masters and slaves, how they all relate, reciprocally submit one to another. It just fits the one big idea. And then once you got that all figured out and we're all standing strong, then we can also stand against the attacks of the devil. One know. unit, one body. So y'all going to have to get the Seven Heresies book along with the four Eden podcast books because... Yes. Yeah. Just, okay. I mean, I I know y'all can't see it really well, but I'm just giving you a taste to whet your appetite, so you'll. Okay, but the, the books. we got to say the title. The key words are the leadership heresies. Leadership heresies. Yes, sir. You're you're right. I I do my shortcuts. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Can I, can I just? Charlotte has to ask a question. But let me show you real quick. Yeah. That's it. There we go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And we pick up those same ideas They in the four books, in the four Eden books, uh, that comes up too. Yeah. Yes, sir. They do. Yeah. All right. Any any last question here before we stop the recording? For this? I, I just wanted to say one thing on uh, Ephesians 23. When I'm talking to people, okay. it is so hard for most folks that I've talked to to get past where it says, as Christ is the head of the church, they see that as Christ has authority over the church. So they see that as authority, and that's a really hard one to get past. But you have talked about that word head being kephale or kephale. I don't know how you would pronounce it, but 
that is where I've had to try to go and hone in on that head meant literally head in Greek. It's not authority, which is really what most people say. They can't get past it. They won't go any further because they can't get past that not well, being authority. You're right. You're right. But let the Bible interpret the Bible. So what's the last part of that verse? And is himself its savior? Yeah. Does that sound like authority? And that's well, that's authority. beside the point. That's no, beside no, the no, point. No, no. With, most people, with most people, it's beside the point. They're like, no, no Christ is a, has authority over the church. So the husband has authority over the wife. I've come yeah. up against that so many times. Yeah, but now just finish the verse. Just say, look, you got to look. What do you do with this the himself savior of the body? Hmm. what do you do with that it, obviously he's not talking about uh, authority he's talking about something else and you need to think about it interesting okay and that something else would be um service to the service to no unity talking about unity, unity. yeah and see that's the did, most important go ahead jennifer i was going to ask you how does and and is himself its savior relate to unity well, what he's doing is he's he's setting us up for the linchpin in 525. In 525, he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ. Okay, now here's the big point. As Christ did what in 525? He did two things. Loved and gave himself up. Okay, so he loved the church and he gave himself up for the church. So when he loved, that's... It's enriching what we're going to get when we get down to 532, when we say, you know, that the Christ and the church are one. What does that mean? Well, go down to 525. He just talked about it. Christ loved the body, so he's loving us. What does that mean, love the body? Well, as a, a person cares for their own physical body, they wash it and clean it and do all that kind of comb it, you know. And then in verse 23, as Christ gave himself up, he was the Savior. So we need to actively love and care and then we also have to actively give up our rights and share you know take care of care of the others all of this stuff has nothing to do with authority over and under it's different stuff and it's talking about how we get along and how christ you know gave birth to us saved us fills us and how we work together teaching and correcting one another submitting to that that's what, so this is not the longest passage on marriage in the new testament it might be the longest passage on body life it's an old saying but you know that's what this is this is how we get along together we're filled with the spirit and this is how we get to act 5 15 to 6 9 it's great it's a great passage it's rich and who wants to mess it up more than satan and um he has you know i don't think most of these commentators felt they were active tools of satan they're not trying to do that but when you shift to English where we've got four or five paragraphs in a row and you think I got a lead sentence here, you miss the whole idea that the key sentence is in the middle of this. Of, and by the way, the chiasm is not the whole passage. The chiasm is 22 to 69. Prior to the chiasm, you have a fours and you have two more fours. So the passage is, now there was a very good scholar who was raised in the Middle East, became a Presbyterian professor in the Middle East all his life. And he talked about a passage in the Old Testament that was often used by the Hebrews, and it's used here too. It's called the jump, jump, high jump. The jump, jump, high jump pattern. And so the first jump is 5, 15 to 18. That's the first jump. Second jump is 19a down to 21. And then the high jump starts in 22 and keeps going. So it's a, it's a, it's to me, it's an undeniably clear pattern typical of of hebrew uh literary patterns and delivers a great message not the message we've laid on top of it but we need to let it speak forth and and shine out okay we're going to stop the the video right here hang on though okay we'll be i'll be right back